Diablo, The Sin War, Book 1, Birthright, written by Richard A. Knack and narrated by Anthony Pope. Prologue The world was young then, and only a few knew it as sanctuary, or knew that not only did angels and demons exist, but some of them had caused sanctuary to be there in the first place. The names Inarius, Diablo, Rafma, Mephisto, or Baal, to name a powerful and often dread few, had not yet been whispered on mortal lips. In this simpler time, ignorant of the eternal battle between the high heavens and the burning hells, people struggled and prospered, they lived and they died. They couldn't know that even then the eyes of both immortal sides would soon cover their potential, and thus begin a conflict that would spill over into all the centuries to come. And of all those most terribly ignorant of Sanctuary's awful destiny, Uldisian Uldiomed, Uldisian, son of Diomedes, could be said to have been the most blind. Blind, though he would be himself at the center of what the scholars of the world's secret history would come to call the Sin War. It wasn't a war in the sense of men-at-arms, though those were there too, but rather a trying, a testing and taking of souls. A war that would forever eradicate the innocence of sanctuary and those inhabiting it, changing all, even those not aware. A war that was both won and lost. From the books of Calon, first tome, second leaf. 1. The shadow fell across Uldisian Uldiomed's table, enveloping not only much of it, but also his hand and his as of yet undrunk ale. The sandy haired farmer didn't have to look up to know who interrupted his brief respite from the day's labor. He had heard the newcomer speaking to others in the boar's head, the only tavern in the remote village of Saram, heard him speaking and prayed silently but vehemently that he wouldn't come to Uldisian's table. It was ironic that the son of Diomedes prayed for the stranger to keep away, for what stood waiting for Uldisian to look up was none other than a missionary from the Cathedral of Light. Resplendent in his colored silver-white robes, resplendent save for the ring of ceramium mud at the bottom, he no doubt awed many a villager in Uldisian's village. However, his presence did nothing but dredge up terrible memories for the farmer, who now angrily fought to keep his stare fixed on the mug. Have you seen the light, my brother? The figure finally asked when it was clear that his potential convert planned to continue to ignore him. Has the word of the great prophet touched your soul? Find someone else, Uldisian muttered, his free hand involuntarily tightening into a fist. He finally took a gulp of his ale, hoping that his remark would end this unwanted conversation. However, the missionary was not to be put off. Setting a hand on the farmer's forearm, and thereby keeping the ale from again touching Uldisian's lips, the pale man said, If not yourself alone, think of your loved ones. Would you forsake their souls as... The farmer roared, his face red with a rage no longer held in check. In a single motion, Uldisian leapt up and seized the startled missionary by the collar. As the table tipped over, the ale fell and splattered on the planked floor, unnoticed by its former drinker. Around the room, other patrons, including a few rare travelers passing through, eyed the confrontation with concern and interest, and from experience chose to keep out of it. Some of the locals, who knew the son of Diomedes well, shook their heads or muttered to one another at the newcomer's poor choice of words. The missionary was a hand taller than Uldisian, no small man himself at just over six feet, but the broad-shouldered farmer outweighed him by half again as much, and all that muscle from day after day of tilling the soil and seeing to the animals. Uldisian was a square-jawed man, with the bearded, rough-hewn features typical of the region west of the great state city of Kajan, the jewel of the eastern half of the world. 
Deep brown eyes burned into the more pale ones of the gaunt, and surprisingly young, features of the cathedral's proselytizer. The souls of most of my family are beyond the prophet's gathering, brother. They died almost ten years ago, all to the plague. I shall say a prayer for them, for them then. His words only served to infuriate Uldisian, who had himself prayed for his parents, his elder brother, and the two sisters constantly over the months through which they had suffered. Day and night, often with no sleep in between, he had first prayed to whatever power watched over them that they recover. Then, when that no longer seemed to be a hope, that their deaths would be swift and painless. And that prayer, too, had gone unanswered. Uldisian, distraught and helpless, had watched as, one by one, they died in anguish. Only he and his youngest brother, Mendel, had survived to bury the rest of the family. Even then there had been missionaries, and even then they had talked of the souls of the family and how their particular sects had the answer to everything. To a one they had promised Uldisian that, if he followed their particular path, he would find peace over his loved one's losses. But Uldisian, once a devout believer, had very vocally denounced each and every one of them. Their words rang hollow, and his refusal seemed later justified when the missionary sex faded away as surely as each season on the farm. But not all. The Cathedral of Light, though only of recent origin, seemed far stronger than most of its predecessors. Indeed, it, and the longer-established Temple of the Triune, seemed to be quickly becoming the two dominant forces seeking the souls of Kajan's people. To Uldisian, the fervent enthusiasm with which both sought out new converts bordered on a strenuous competition much in conflict with their spiritual message. And that was yet another reason Uldisian would have no part of either. Pray for yourself, not for me and mine he growled. The missionary's eyes bulged as Uldisian easily hefted him by the collar off the floor. The squat, balding figure behind the counter slipped out to intervene. Tibian was several years senior and no match against Uldisian, but he had been Diomedes' good friend, and so his words had an effect on the furious farmer. Uldisian, mind my establishment if you can't mind yourself, eh? Uldisian hesitated, the proprietor's words cutting through his anguish. His gaze swept from the pale face before him to Tibian's round one, then back again. A frustrated scowl still on his face, he let the figure in his grip drop in an undignified heap on the floor. Uldisian, Tibian started. But the son of Diomedes didn't wait to hear the rest. Hands shaking, he strode out of the boar's head, his heavy, worn leather boots clattering hard on the well-trod planks. Outside, the air was crisp, which helped soothe Uldisian some. Almost immediately, he began to regret his actions inside. Not the reasons for them, but that he had acted before so many of those who knew him, and not for the first time. Still, the presence of the cathedral's acolyte in Saram grated on his heart. Uldisian was now a man who only believed what his eyes showed him, and what his hands could touch. He could see the changes in the sky, and so tell when he needed to rush his work in the field, or whether time enough remained to complete his task at a more moderate pace. The crops his work brought forth from the soil fed him and others. Those were things he could trust, not the muttered praying of clerics and missionaries that had done nothing for his family but give them false hope. Saram was a village of about 200 folk, small by many standards, of reasonable size by others. Uldisian could have paced its length in as many breaths, if that much. His farm lay two miles north of Saram. Once a week, Ulysian went into the village to get what supplies he needed, always allowing himself the short breaks for food and drink at the tavern. His meal he had eaten, and his ale was lost, which left only his tasks to complete before he departed again. 
In addition to the tavern, which also acted as an inn, there were only four other buildings of consequence in Saram. The meeting house, the trading station, the village guard quarters, and the smithy. All of them shared the same design as the rest of the structures of Saram, with the roofs pointed and thatched, and the bodies wooden planks over a frame whose base was built of several layers of stone and clay. As was typical in most areas under the influence of Kejan, the windows of each were arched sharply at the top, and always numbered three on a side. In truth, from a distance, it was impossible to tell one building from the other. Mud caked his boots as he walked. Saram was too provincial to have paved roads, or even stone ones. There was a small, dry path on the opposite side from where Wildesian trod. But at the moment, he had no patience for it. And besides, as a farmer, he was used to being one with the soil. At the eastern edge of Saram, and thus nearest to Kajan, stood the trading station. The station was, other than the tavern, the busiest of places in Saram. Here it was that the locals brought in their goods to trade for other necessities, or even to sell to passing merchants. When there were new items in stock, a blue banner would be raised by the doorway up front, and as he approached, Uldisian saw Cyrus's nightdress daughter, Serenthia, doing just that. Cyrus and his family had run the trading station for four generations, and were among the most prominent of families in the village, although they dressed no more fancy than anyone else. The trader didn't like looking down on his customers who were, for the most part, his neighbors. Serenfia, for example, was clad in a simple cloth dress of brown, cut modestly at the bodice, and whose bottom hem ended just above the ankle. Like most villagers, she wore sensible boots, designed for both riding and walking through the muddy ruts in the main street. Hey, something of interest, he called out to Serenfia trying to focus on other matters in order to forget both the incident and the images of the past it had conjured up. Cyrus's daughter turned at the sound of his voice, her thick, long hair fluttering about. With her bright blue eyes, ivory skin, and naturally red lips, Uldisian felt certain that all she needed was a proper gown to allow her to compete with the best of the blue-blood females in Kajan itself. The unadorned dress didn't hide her curves, nor did it detract in any way from the graceful manner in which she moved regardless of the terrain. Uldisian, where have you been all day? There was that in her tone that all but made the farmer grimace. Serenthia was more than a decade younger than him, and he had seen her grow up from a child to a woman. To him, she was nearly one of the sisters he had lost. However, to her, Uldisian evidently seemed a lot more. She had turned down the attentions of younger and more affluent farmers than him, not to mention the flirtations of several visiting merchants. The only other man in whom she showed any interest was Achilleos, Uldisian's good friend and the best hunter in Saram. But whether that was because of his ties to the farmer, it was difficult to say. I arrived just past the first hour of day, he replied. As he neared, he caught glimpses of at least three wagons behind Cyrus's establishment. A fair-sized caravan for Saram, what's going on? She finished up hoisting the banner, then tethered up the rope. Gazing over her shoulder at the wagons, Serenfia said, They got lost, actually. They were bound for passage through Tulisam. Tulisam was the next nearest habitation, a town at least five times as big as Saram. It was also more on the route from Kejan proper to the sea, where the master ports were. Uldisian grunted. The handler must be a novice. Well, whatever the cause, they've decided to trade some. Father's trying to hide his excitement. They've got some beautiful things, Uldisian. To the son of Diomedes, beautiful things generally consisted of strong, sturdy tools, or a newborn calf that had its health. He started to speak, then noticed someone walking by the wagons. She was dressed akin to a noble of one of the houses that sought to fill the gap of leadership caused by the recent infighting between the ruling mage clans. 
Her lush golden hair was bound up behind her head with a silver band, allowing full view of her regal ivory face. Glittering green eyes surveyed her surroundings. Slim, perfect lips parted as the woman, the shoulders of her flowing emerald gown covered by a fur, viewed the landscape to the east of Saram. The bodice of the gown was changed tight, and although her clothing was the epitome of the ruling caste, it left no doubt that she was very much female. Just as the arresting figure began to glance in Uldisian's direction, Serenfia abruptly took him by the arm. You should come inside and see for yourself, Uldisian. As she steered him towards the twin wooden doors, the farmer took a quick look back, but of the noble woman he saw no sign. Had he not known himself to be incapable of such elaborate fancies, Uldisian would have almost believed her to be a product of his imagination. Serenfia all but pulled him inside, Cyrus's daughter shutting the doors behind them particularly hard. Inside, her father glanced up from a conversation with a cowled merchant. The two older men appeared to be haggling over a bundle of what the farmer thought rather luxurious purple cloth. Ah, good old Dissian. The trader prefaced everyone's name, save for that of his family, with the word, something that always made old Dissian smile. Cyrus didn't even notice that he did it. How fare you and your brother? We... we're fine, Master Cyrus. Good, good. And with that, the trader went back to his business. With but a ring of silvering hair around his otherwise clean pate and scholarly eyes, Cyrus looked more like a cleric to the farmer than any of those wearing such robes. In fact, Uldisian had heard far more sensible words from the man. He respected Cyrus greatly, in part because of how the trader, more educated than most in Saram, had taken Mendel under his wing. Thinking of his brother, who spent more time in this very building than he did at the farm, Uldisian glanced around. Although Mendel would have been clad in garments akin to his brother's, cloth, tunic, kilt, and boots, and resembled his brother somewhat in the eyes and broad nose, one look at him by anyone would raise the question of whether he was actually a farmer. In truth, although he did help out at the farm, working the land was clearly not Mendel's calling. He was always interested in studying things, be it the bugs burrowing in the ground, or words in some parchment loaned him by the merchant. Uldisian could read and write too, and was proud of this achievement, but he saw only the practical aspects of such a thing. There were times when pacts had to be made which required writing things down and then making certain that they said what they were supposed to say. That the older brother understood. Simply reading for reading's sake, or studying merely to learn something of no use in their daily task, such a desire evaded Uldisian. He did not see his brother, who had this time ridden in with him, but something else caught his attention. A sight that brought him back fully and painfully, the memory of what had happened in the boar's head. At first glimpse, he thought the figure a companion of the missionary he had accosted. But then, as the young woman turned more in his direction, the farmer saw that she wore an entirely different set of robes. These were of a deep azure, and had upon the breast a golden, stylized ram with great curled horns. Below the ram was an iridescent triangle, whose tip jutted up just below the animal's hooves. Her hair had been shorn to shoulder length, and the face that the tresses framed was round, full of youth and highly attractive. Yet there she was, in Uldisian's mind, something missing that removed for him any desire for her. It was as if she was an empty shell, not a whole person. He had seen her like before, zealous, an absolute believer in her faith. He had also seen the robes before, and the fact that she was alone made him suddenly eye the room with dread. They never traveled alone, always in threes, one for each of their order. Serenfia was trying to show him some feminine bauble, but Uldisian only heard her voice, not her words. He considered trying to back out of the chamber. 
Then another figure joined the first. This one a middle-aged man of strong bearing and patrician features, who, with his cleft chin and strong brow, would have appealed to the fairer sex as much as the girl would have the males. He wore a tight-collared golden robe that also bore the triangle, but this time above it was a green leaf. The third of their band was nowhere to be seen, but Uldesia knew that he, or she, couldn't be far away. The servants of the Temple of the Triune didn't stay separated for long. While a missionary from the cathedral often worked alone, the Triune's acolytes acted in concert with one another. They would preach the way of the three, their guiding spirits, Bala, Dialon, and Methis, who supposedly watched over a mortal like loving parents or kind teachers. Dialon was the spirit of determination, hence the stubborn ram. Bala stood for creation, represented by the leaf. Mephis, whose servant was missing, was love. The acolytes of that order bore upon their breast a red circle, the common Kejan emblem for the heart. Having heard of the preachings of all three orders before, and not wanting to risk a repeat of the debacle at the tavern, Uldisian tried to shift into the shadows. Serenfia had finally realized that Uldisian was not listening to her. She put her hands on her hips and gave him the stare that, when she had been a child, had made him give in to her way. Uldisian, I thought you wanted to see... He cut her off. Sari, I've got to get going. Did your brothers gather what I asked for earlier? She pursed her lips as she fought. Uldisian eyed the two missionaries, who seemed engrossed in some conversation. Both looked mildly disoriented, as if something had not gone as they had assumed it would. Teal said nothing to me, or else I would have known you were in Saram before. Let me go find him and ask. I'll come with you. Anything to avoid the dogs of the Triune. The temple had been established some years before the cathedral, but now the two appeared more or less even in their influence. It was said that the High Magistrate of Kajan was now a convert of the former, while the Lord General of the Kajan Guard was rumored to be a member of the latter. The disarray with the mage clans, often bordering on war of late, had turned many to the comfort of one message or another. But before Serenfia could lead them into the back, Cyrus called for his daughter. She gave Uldisian an apologetic look. Wait here, I'm not gonna be long. I'm gonna go look after Phil myself, he suggested. Serentia must have caught his quick glance at the missionaries. Her expression grew reproving. Uldesian, not again. Seri. Uldesian, these people are messengers of holy orders. They mean you no harm. If you would just open yourself up to hearing them, I'm not suggesting you join one or the other, but the messages they preach are worthy of your attention. She had reprimanded him like this before, just after he had stood up in the tavern after the last visit by missionaries from the Triune, and gone on at length about the lack of need for any of their ilk in the lives of the common folk. Did the acolytes offer to help shear the sheep or bring in the crops? Did they help wash the mud-soaked clothes or lend in their hands fixing the fences? No. Uldisian had pointed out then, as he had on other occasions, that all they came to do was to whisper in the ears of the people that their sect was the better one. This, to people who barely understood the concept of angels or demons, much less believed in them. They can call out all the pretty words they want, Seri, but all I see is them contesting against each other, with how many fools they can brand as their own as what decides the winner. Serenfia, Cyrus called again. Come here, lass. Father needs me, she said with a rueful look. I'll be right back. Please, Uldisian, behave yourself. The farmer watched her hurry off, then tried to fix his attention on some of the items on sale or barter in the station. There were tools of all sorts that could have proved useful for the farm, including hoes, shovels, and a variety of hammers. Uldisian ran his finger over the edge of a new iron sickle. 
The craftsmanship was the best available in a place like Saram, although he had heard that in some estate farms near Kajan, a few lords had their workers wielding one tipped with steel. Such a concept had far more impact on Uldisian than any words concerning spirits or souls. Then someone quickly strode past him, heading into the back. He had a glimpse of golden hair bound up, and a hint of a smile that the son of Diomedes could have sworn was being directed at him. Without at first realizing it, Uldisian followed. The noblewoman vanished through the back door as if the station was her own home. He slipped through a moment later, and at first saw no sign of her. What he did see was that his wagon was indeed full. There was no sign of feel, but that was not uncommon. Serenfia's eldest brother was likely assisting with some other labor. Having already dealt with the matter of payment, Uldisian headed towards the wagon. However, as he neared, he suddenly saw a flash of green by the horse. It was her. The noblewoman stood on the other side of the animal, murmuring something to it, while she caressed the muzzle with one slender hand. Uldisian's horse appeared mesmerized by her, standing as motionless as a statue. The old male was an ordinary beast, and only those who knew him well could approach him without the danger of a bite. That this woman could do so spoke volumes about her to the farmer. She noticed him in turn. A smile lit up her face. To Uldisian, her eyes seemed to glow. Forgive me, is this your horse? It is, my lady, and you're lucky to still have more than one hand. He likes to bite. She caressed the muzzle again. The beast continued to stand still. Oh, he wouldn't bite me. The woman leaned her face close to the muzzle. Would you? Uldisian half started towards her suddenly fearful that she would be proven wrong. However, again, nothing happened. I once owned a horse that looked very much like him, she continued. I miss him so. Suddenly recalling where they were, Uldisian said, Mistress, you shouldn't be here. You should be with a caravan. Sometimes the travelers journeyed with merchants in order to make use of the protection of the latter's gods. Uldisian could only assume that this was the case for her, although so far it seemed that she was without any escort. Even with the protection of the caravan, a young woman traveling alone risked danger. But I'm not going with the caravan, the noblewoman murmured. I'm not going anywhere at all. He could not believe that he had heard her correctly. My lady, you must be joking. There's nothing for you in a place like Saram. There's nothing for me in any other place. Why not Saram, then? Her mouth curled up in a hesitant smile. And you do not need to keep calling me my lady or mistress. You may call me Lilia. Uldisian opened his mouth to answer, only to hear the door swinging open behind him and Serenfia's voice call. There you are. Did you find Phil? He looked over his shoulder at her. No, but everything's here, Sari. His horse suddenly snorted, then shied away from him. Grabbing the bit, Uldisian did his best to calm the cantankerous beast. The horse's eyes were wide and his nostrils flared. To his master he seemed startled or frightened. That made little sense, for the creature liked Serenfia more than he did even Uldisian. As for the noblewoman, she... She was nowhere to be seen. Uldisian surreptitiously surveyed the area, wondering how she could have possibly slipped away so quickly and without a sound. He had a fair view for some distance, but all he saw were the other wagons. Unless she climbed into one of the covered ones, the farmer couldn't possibly fathom what had happened to her. Serenfia walked up to him, mildly curious at his behavior. What are you looking for? Is something you need missing after all? He recovered enough to answer. No, as I said, it's all here. A familiar and undesired shape slipped through the doorway. The missionary glanced around as if searching for someone or something in particular. Yes, Brother Attilas? asked Serenfia. I seek our brother Caligio. Is he not there? 
No, brother, there's only the two of us. Brother Attila's idol Dician, without the usual religious fervor the farmer was accustomed to seeing from his ilk. Instead, the missionary's gaze held a hint of what seemed like suspicion. Bowing his head to Serenthia, Attilus withdrew. Cyrus's daughter turned her attention back to Uldician. Do you have to leave so soon? I know you feel uncomfortable around brother Attilus and the others, but couldn't you stay and visit with me a bit longer? For reasons that he couldn't actually explain, Uldician felt unsettled. No, no, I, I have to head back. Speaking of looking for someone, have you seen Mendeln? I expected him to be here with your father. Oh, I should have told you. Achilleo stopped by just a short while earlier. He had something he wanted to show to Mendeln, and the two of them just headed off into the western forest. Uldician grunted. Mendeln had promised him that he would be ready at the proper time to ride home. Generally, his brother was very good at keeping his word, but Achilles must have come across something unusual. Mendel's greatest weakness was his incessant curiosity, something the hunter should have known better than to encourage. Once started on on one of his studies, the younger son of Diomedes lost all track of time. But although Uldician would not leave without his one remaining sibling, he didn't want to be anywhere near the Triune's followers. I can't stay. I'll lead the wagon out to the forest and hope that I find them. Should Mendel somehow return here without me seeing him, I'll tell him where you wait, yes. Serenfia didn't attempt to hide her disappointment. Feeling uncomfortable for a more normal reason, the farmer gave her a brief and merely friendly hug and climbed aboard. Cyrus's daughter stepped back as he urged his old horse on. He looked back in her direction as the wagon moved and the intensity of his expression made Serenfia's own countenance lighten up. Uldician paid her reaction no mind, for his thoughts were not on the trader's raven-haired daughter. No, the face that had burned itself into his thoughts was that of another, one whose dresses were golden, and one whose caste was far, far above that of a simple farmer.